Hello, welcome to our next interview at the channel of the Cloud Report. I'm here at the Green Web Foundation office in Berlin and um, I'm very happy to talk to Chris Adams, the executive director of the foundation, who I met at the Green Tech Festival uh, some weeks ago at the Berlin Tegel yeah. Airport. And um, I learned about the Green Web Foundation and I want you to learn about it as well. So please introduce yourself and tell us what is the Green Web Foundation. All right, so um, the Green Web Foundation um, exists for a fair and sustainable internet. And uh, more specifically, the thing we are working towards is an entirely fossil free internet by 2030. Because we see the fact that the internet runs mostly on fossil fuels as a bug that can be fixed. And we see it, we see, and that's basically the, the main thing we work for. So we, 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 we achieve this by creating open data to, for people to understand their own kind of tech stack, see where to make changes to kind of end up with a greener tech stack. We also create open source code. So we create libraries for people to kind of plug into their own kind of cloud software so they can understand the environmental impact of what they do. And uh, we also work, at, we also provide training and consulting for organizations that are trying to accelerate their transition away from fossil fuels to greener forms of energy. So in my um, mind, uh, the internet belongs to everybody or uh, everybody is, uh, have a part of, um, of the internet or, and um, a lot of people are hosting their own um, websites and, and so on. Um, how do you reach the people or um, how do you um, can make this big, not organization, worldwide uh, something greener? So I think there's two main things that it's worth bearing in mind. I guess the first one is that you reach people mainly through the technology they're currently using. And over the last 10 years, for better or worse, you've ended up with a somewhat more centralized internet. So there's a number of smaller providers uh, that you would probably need to kind of have some influence on to either, either make them, uh, encourage them to move faster in some cases, or where they are doing the right thing, point to that as an example of saying, this is what everyone else should be doing as well. And uh, so that's one thing that you do. Um, so the question was, how do you actually go about doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. And the I think the other thing is that most developers, I think, or most technologists, I think they want to do the right thing. And a lot of the time, they're not quite sure what the right thing might actually be. So if you make it easier for people to understand, okay, these are some of the steps I can do, and these are the arguments I can use, then you're able to end up with a better default. And if you work as a technologist, and you're looking primarily internally at the impact of your own tools, not necessarily externally, like what am I using it for? If you look at it internally, then one of the most obvious things you can do is switch to using green energy and speed this transition away from fossil fuels because we have literally decades of evidence of si where scientists have basically been telling us the problem is fossil fuels. We need to get off fossil fuels. They're expensive, they're volatile, and they are making everyone's energy bills go higher and higher and higher. So the sooner we can get off them, the better. Um, I guess you are working with a lot of partners. Yes. Um, which are they and... Um, so, yeah, the thing I can tell you, so we work with uh, some governments. So we did done some work with the German government, actually, when they're trying to build some tools to help, under help technologists understand the environmental impact of any, of, the tool, uh, of any of the software they're using. There's one project called Software, uh, which is specifically building some, soft, some tools to work out the environmental impact of a number of libraries that are people use in their technology stack. So we do some work with governments. We also help uh, larger organizations figure out what their kind of strategy might actually be in terms of, okay, how do we actually argue for this? Uh, or how do we actually make this argument so if they're maybe we, we speak to particular teams inside the company say these are the arguments you can use to get management to ask for something to move more quickly because a lot of the time there are very convincing arguments i mean a there's the kind of whole cost aspect but uh, there's also aspects like if you're a technologist you probably want to work at a company that feels like it's doing the right thing and uh, you can probably make a you can often make a quite strong argument that if you want to retain your best people 
or attract lots of new talent, then being able to show that you're doing something on climate is a real, a real attractor. So there's stuff like that. But there's also the fact that lots of technologists who work with cloud and work with technology, they like a lot of the kind of shiny, cool things that you can do with technology to make it more efficient or make it make better use of energy so that you use it when it's greenest, for example. You can do things to, say, run particular cloud jobs when it's really sunny outside or windy rather than when it's not so windy and not so sunny where you're usually falling back to, say, fossil fuels. So there's things like that that you can do. And once you realize that, you might be looking for libraries or tools to make that easier for you to use. And we build some of those tools to enable developers to make those changes. So there's one tool called uh, CO2.js. This is used by a number of the, I guess, digital sustainability tools now. One of them is called EcoGrader in America. Another one is called Website Carbon. Uh, there's another one called EcoPing. These are things you can use to basically look at the environmental impact of a digital service and then optimize it for carbon. And similarly, we build tools uh, written in Go, for example, which plug into things like Kubernetes or Nomad or other, other scheduling tools. So that cool kind of, let's run my jobs when the energy is, che is cheapest and greenest, you can do that as well. So that's the kind of stuff we do. And we also work with industry bodies so that you can argue for this or you can end up with, say, market conditions that reward you for this kind of stuff or that you're able to set norms to make it easier to become a green software engineer. And that's some of the work we do with groups like, yeah, the Green Software Foundation. Go on. Okay. That would be my, my next question. Ah, sorry, I've already like <laughs> preempted what you're going to say. So uh, the Green Software Foundation is an example of that. So we are a small but growing nonprofit based in, uh, based between Berlin and uh, and Wageningen in the Netherlands. So there's a limited reach that we're going to have but if we're able to work with larger organizations and uh, set some practices that, and, and help establish best practices or make the case for that or for, for green software, then we have some outsize impact. So I work as the chair at, uh, for the Green Software Foundation Policy Group. And that's an organization with groups like, say, ThoughtWorks, GitHub, Microsoft, Accenture, larger organizations who are interested in this kind of goal as well, who want to basically do the right thing a lot of the time when they're building tools so that the tools and the services we build, we can feel better about the impact they actually have on the outside world. For me, it's, um, it's very, very interesting information that the global players are um, engaged in these um, topics uh, because they uh, are running the most, uh, yeah, digital services. Yeah. So it is um, important that they... Uh... Yeah, this is actually the case with cloud, for example. Yeah. Because it's so centralized, you kind of have to engage with the fact that you essentially have three companies making up 90% of the market. Generally means that if you want to see any kind of meaningful change or if you want to move things to move faster, you're going to have to engage and speak to these folks and see what they can do. And a lot of the time, they, if we just look at their internal usage, they have the scale to actually have, have a meaningful impact on, say, the carbon intensity of electricity or how quickly we move. I mean, for context, say, technology firms over the last, I think, about five years have been the largest corporate investor in renewables uh, globally, which uh, means that when you have lots and lots of, uh, lots of organizations piling lots of money into uh, some kind of technology like say, renewable energies, which demonstrate the same learning rates that we've seen with technology, that brings down the cost for everyone else. So this is why one of the arguments we make, we think you should, by doing this, you make it easier to create a transition for everyone else who also is relying on electricity becoming cleaner for us to kind of get away from the current destructive default. So yeah, that's the stuff that we do. And we think that this is actually a relatively new space or it's, it, 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 because it's a new space, there's a chance to have some of these uh, have these conversations early and set some, well, basically better defaults than than you might otherwise have, like defaulting to fossil fossil energy. If you can set defaults to use the greenest energy possible automatically, then you can have it. You know that, that that that's an improvement. You don't even need to be a specialist in energy markets 
if that's some of these tools have been built. Because in many ways, code is very much like serialized domain knowledge. And this is how we've dealt with complexity in other parts of the industry. The field you are working on is, is very big. Yes, the World Wide Web, but also the, the technology field and the, the different layers of, of this um, technology. Um, you, are, you said you are a non-profit organization. Um, how many people do you have? Oh, there's about, honestly, we're not that large. We're between, depending on how you're looking at how you count people, it's so between five and ten people at the moment. So we're very, very, very small compared to some of these huge organizations. And this is actually quite this is why this is why we engage with with some industry bodies. Like the Green Software Foundation is one group. Uh, there's another group called the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance. They're a European gr group who do similar work to this. We contribute to working groups there because we've been doing this for quite some time. And this is a play, this is a way that we're able to share all the stuff that we have learned so that we can ideally have outsized impact because if you are able to set default or contribute into a for in, into a forum like this where there are organizations which have much more scale but traditionally have not had internally inter like sustainability focused people or have not invested so much over the last 10 to 15 years then again you can help nudge things in a somewhat different direction so this is one of the things we've been doing and yeah, that's one that's in our theory of change to achieve some outsized uh, impact is by partnering up wherever we can, because this is this is a lot cheaper than having to hire a bunch of our own people for if nothing else, to be honest. Yeah. So you spread the word about uh, sustainable technology, and um, do you want to? talk about uh, a project or is yeah. that something you, you already achieved? Yeah, I think the, what's the most, the thing that I probably am, I've enjoyed most recently, I think we've been doing some work with, we first around this, first of all, we started organizing a fellowship specifically for technologists who were trying to incorporate an awareness of like climate justice and kind of the climate and like climate awareness in their work. So these are people who might be, say, programmers or product managers or IT directors. Uh, we basically funded them to spend, a, say, about a year or so uh, researching independently, blogging about what they've learned, <laughs> coming, about, coming up with like, mental models to address their stuff. And then what we've actually done now as a result of that is we've ended up working by blog, by working in the open, we've been able to basically work, uh, start conversations and create and help, and help form communities in existing open source projects. So from this fellowship, uh, we are, I, I can point to things like the creation of a sustainability group specifically inside WordPress. And uh, we see that as like quite a useful thing to do because if 25% of the internet is running on WordPress or the <laughs> web and you can get those folks to kind of start caring about this and you give them the arguments and the tooling and the ideas to use it. And that's one way that you can actually have some scalable impact there. So stuff like that is one thing, for example. And uh, one thing I found recently is we did a, a, a talk that, uh, that I, I did at, Chaos, at the Chaos Communication Congress a couple of years ago. I just had a conversation this morning, actually, with some people at the NHS, which is uh, you know, the, one of the largest employers on earth. They were getting in touch and asking about some of the spreadsheets and some of the calculations we've been using because they're saying, hi, we want to incorporate an awareness of climate into all our digital projects so that if any project is going to be funded, there is, there is an awareness of, of sustainability baked into this. And uh, that feels like one way that by working in the open and having things available for people to kind of riff on and work with, we've been able to achieve some outsized impact considering our admittedly somewhat tiny size. So those are two things that we do. But the thing that, I mean, I think the thing that I'm really um, in interested in right now, like the, real, the, the nerd in me loves the fact that we, there's, there's two kind of big schedulers in the world of cloud. There's like Kubernetes and there's Nomad. Um, I'm a big fan of Nomad and we use Nomad internally. And uh, just by having some conversations with, uh, on the community forums there, we're like, hi, wouldn't it be cool if Nomad could do this? Or uh, could it could like, 
if Nomad knew when energy was green, or Nomad knew how to schedule jobs to the right place so that you can tread as lightly as possible on the, on, on, on the, inter, on the environment. Uh, we ended up actually kind of unprompted. We basically had some conversations with them, like this would be cool. And then we didn't think much about it. And then we found out that there's actually now like a carbon aware branch of Nomad, Nomad being built, which incorporates all these ideas into the core product. And that's like, wow, that's really, really nice to have this. Like, we don't have the time to build this stuff, all this stuff ourselves. But if we're able to share these ideas and say, these are things you'll be optimizing for, here's how to have some impact, then you basically empower engineers to basically take ideas that they have seen and they're excited about, and then implement versions of this in their own kind of context. So yeah, that was actually made me extremely happy when I found out about that kind of stuff, because yeah, that's a large company where a change there means that it's then being consumed by like Cloudflare, by Roblox, by all these ones. And that's the smaller of the cloud providers. So we're now doing something with, uh, we now, one of our members, uh, he's now working with the Cloud Native Foundation, their new environmental working group. So we're talking about, okay, what are the levers in Kubernetes land? What could you do there? So this is some of the stuff that we tend to do or are interested in doing. And like, this is like kind of techie stuff we have, I suppose. But there's a whole kind of cultural aspect of that as well. So the people who write about this work, we, try, we do what we can to give them a voice and to publish uh, and, and signal boost what we see is really, really like, honestly, like really cool, responsible, uh, forward looking work. So there's a magazine that we publish uh, with an online community called climateaction.tech. It's called Branch. Uh, because there's a, yeah, it's a kind of nerd joke about Git and everything like that, but also <laughs> branch, leaves, plants, yeah. So the thing that we do there is we, we feature the kind of writing from, people, from the likes of folks who work for Google, for Amazon and so on, but we also feature writing from the folks who are from the Amazon, so that you end up having a kind of wider, more kind of expansive understanding of what it means to be an engineer and what the climate crisis is and how you can use your professional mobility and your skills to basically be helping solve some of the problems to kind of help us steer us away from this iceberg rather than accelerate towards it. Because a lot of the time, when we don't talk about what the technology we're using is used for, we can kind of end up defaulting to things which can probably be more harmful than we'd like to think about or admit to ourselves, I suppose. And like, this is one thing that you're not gonna fix with technology necessarily, you're going to do that, you're going to fix it with shifts in culture or changing some of the narrative around what we aspire to or what we consider acceptable. But we've seen cases where this has happened. If you look at things like accessibility online, accessibility in my view is a way to kind of deliver on the promise of like the web and the internet for everyone, you know? And uh, we, you now see lots, lots more people establishing kind of communities of practice inside organizations you, you see people building this kind of kindness into their services so that people aren't excluded the way they might have been a few years ago, or, or at least there is something that you recognize and you know you can ask for. And uh, in some ways, this is, I think talking about this and pointing to examples of this means that people who might commission this kind of work, they know to ask for this. So like, I mean, that's one of the examples I find, I, we, we draw a lot of inspiration from is how, things like public sector have been able to end up creating defaults for digital services so that you need to take into account accessibility and make it an inclusive design for people. Because they say every single service should be, uh, we, you should consider that this should be available for everyone, not just uh, a, a small kind of profitable target market of people. And I think that this, this idea, because they were able to set that default, you've ended up with it becoming culturally accepted or cultural, culturally valued inside technologists, in, in, inside like circles where people who build the web to care about this. And I think you can do the same thing with sustainability. In fact, actually, this is one thing that I totally forgot about. Um, there's interest from groups like the W3C now to do this kind of stuff. You know, they realize that, oh, we're in a climate crisis and it turns out that computers use electricity. Maybe we should think about this and where the energy is coming from. How do we minimize that kind of impact? And a lot of the time, people mean well and they, and they want to do the right thing, but they haven't had the incentive for the last 10 years to know what is effective and what isn't effective. And that's where I think that we have a chance to provide some pointers or 
essentially provide a platform for people to be talking about some of these more systemic issues rather than just, well, it's lots of fun just playing with just code. I mean, that's, that's a lever, but it's not the only lever we have. We, we need more levers than just green IT to kind of avert like a climate crisis that's facing us. Thank you so much. That was very much information for now. Yeah. Um, I have to think about and um, I hope we see each other again so <laughs> I can uh, ask more more detailed question um, for now for the introduction of the foundations I think we are done cool thank you so much all right it was a pleasure likewise <laughs>